Hi, my name is Jason Martin with Allgen Financial Advisors. And in this video, I'm going to show you how we manage risk in order to help you have good returns over the long run in the stock market. The most important thing with investing is, be, with investing is to control your emotions. And so I have a quote here that I want to show you from the godfather of value investing, Benjamin Graham. And he says, the chief enemy is likely to be yourself. Uh, and what does that mean? That means if you can't control your emotions and if you get scared and as the stock market's going down and you sell, you just ruined your long-term returns. You locked in losses and you miss out on the upside. So the way we try to manage risk well is to do it in a way where we can help our clients control their emotions well and so they don't have to go through the big roller coaster ride, which is what causes people to sell uh, near the low when their accounts go down so far. So in this first chart, you'll see this is uh, this bar chart here. When you have a drop down, the bar next to it shows how much you have to go up in order to get back to where you started. So for example, if you look here in the middle, uh, when, when your account goes down 50%, so let's take a $100,000 account. When it goes down 50%, you're at $50,000. Well, if you come back up 50%, you're only to $75,000. It takes a 100% return to get back to where you started. And you can see that as you go further to the right, the larger the loss, the larger you have to gain back to get back to where you started. So let's say, for example, you like rolling the dice and you buy a penny stock or you buy some new tech stock or an IPO and it loses 90%. So $100,000 goes down to $10,000. You now have to gain 900% just to get back to where you started. That's why it's so important to manage risk well. As you can see here on the left side of the chart, if you only lose a little, it doesn't take as much to get back. So sometimes with investing, our philosophy anyway, is that if you can manage the downside well, then you, you don't have to do as well on the upside. And, and, and it's, that's super important when you go through really bad bear markets because pretty much anyone can invest if the stock market's going up. But when that stock market goes down, if you sell, that really hurts your long-term returns because there's a whole psychological thing that happens. It's very difficult to get back into the market after you sold. So inevitably you sell, you got scared, you sell, you, you, you locked in those losses. Now you're trying to wait to get back in. By the time you feel good enough to get back in, you've missed out on a huge game. So in this next chart, I wanna show you what it looks like if you could just capture 90% of the downside which that means like, so if the S&P 500 went down 10%, you only went down 9%. By the same time on the upside, it's called upside capture, if you only captured 95% of the upside, so S&P goes up 10%, you go up 9.5%. If you were to do that over time, you can see the difference in returns for a portfolio like that versus the S&P, which is the bottom line, uh, that is, is, is just the S&P. So that's why we feel it's super important to manage that downside risk, to not capture as much of that downside market, but be able to just do pretty good when the market's going up. If you're able to do that successfully over time, then you can end up with good long-term returns. But that's easier said than done. Here's how. It's gonna get a little bit technical, uh, and we have a lot of terms here that may be foreign to some people. Uh, but you know, whether you're investing in mutual funds, exchange traded funds, or individual stocks, here are some of the things that we look at to kind of measure risk, uh, to be able to put together a portfolio, and to be able to set together the, the makings, the engine uh, of, a, of an investment mix that can do well over the long run. So if we're just investing in mutual funds or exchange traded funds, one of the key things we're gonna look at is beta. Beta is a measurement of risk. So for example, if you have a beta of 0.9, then it only takes on 90% of the risk of let's say the benchmark is the S&P 500. So it only takes on 90% of the risk of the S&P 500. Now alpha is another good measure and it's used together with beta. Alpha is the amount of additional return that a particular investment has had over time compared to the benchmark, let's say the S&P 500. So when we're looking for good funds over the long run, 
we want to find funds with the lowest beta as possible, but at the same time, the highest alpha. And you don't just want to look at one short time period. Ideally, you're looking back 20 years if possible, but at least 15 or 10 years to kind of measure that beta and alpha on those funds. So that's super important. And we also talked about upside capture and downside capture. That's another statistic uh, when you look for uh, funds that you can see, you know, how much has this fund gone down, the downside capture uh, in falling markets, and then how much of the upside does it, does it capture? And that's another thing. We want to have the lowest amount of downside capture as possible, but also a very high upside capture. Okay, so switching gears into looking at individual stocks and how we measure risk within individual stocks. One of the things we look at when we're looking at individual stocks is a current ratio. Basically, current assets minus current liabilities. Current assets are liquid money, money in the bank, things you can get to really quickly that are liquid that you can use to spend. And then current liabilities are expenses you're going to have to pay on an ongoing basis. Okay, so. If you have enough current liquid monies that you can get to, then th that's good because then you can pay your expenses. So a good current ratio or one that we look for is a current ratio of one or higher, which means if you have a current ratio of one or higher, you have a year's worth of expenses set aside. So if you're a family, you can think about that as emergency reserves. If you had enough emergency, one year's worth of emergency reserves and you lost your job, well, you can pay for a year's worth of your living expenses. And that would give you time to find another job. Well, with, an, with a company, companies go through recessions and bad times. And so if a company has enough cash on hand, the current liquid money that they could get to, that'll help them weather the bad times. That's something that's very important to help you risk, reduce risk in an individual stock. Another thing we look at is the debt to equity ratio. So debt to equity is simply the amount of debt divided by the equity in the company. So in, in layman's terms, it means they don't carry a ton of debt. They're not highly leveraged. And so think, I like to use the personal examples. So if you have you know, more debt, than what your uh, actual income is or what your overall net worth value is, that puts you in a dangerous situation because you have a lot of money that's being paid to debt. So we look for lower debt to equity ratios. The lower, the better. That means the less debt they have. And, and if you have a very high debt ratio, so we definitely want to see lower than one, but the, the lower, the better. So 0.5 and, and below that would be good. Um, and and you have to keep in mind the companies that have debt ratios much higher than that, while that, those companies can do well, it's just about managing risk. Yes, they can do well, but if they go through a rough time, those stocks may fall further. So we want to find those good, solid, solid fundamental companies that have enough cash on hand and they, they carry less debt loads. So a very simple one to think about uh, from a valuation standpoint is price to earnings. And while we look at a lot of fundamentals, this is a simple one that can help you kind of understand the gist of what we're trying to get at is you don't want to buy overpriced companies. So price to earnings is basically the price of the company uh, divided by the earnings of the company. And it's a measurement of the company's valuation. If you have a high PE ratio, it's considered more expensive. If you have a low PE ratio, it's considered a better value. Now, that's not the only thing we look at. You also want to compare that to its growth of the company, like forward looking growth, because if, if the company is growing at a very fast rate, then it can have a little bit higher of a P.E. ratio. If the company is, is growing very slowly or has negative growth, then you need to have a really, really low P.E. ratio to justify getting in. So that just in general, though, valuation is important. You don't want to buy things that are very expensive. If you think back, if you're in your 40s or beyond and you remember uh, the 2000 through 2002 tech bubble when you had the Amazons of the world that were super expensive, even those were great companies and they ended up doing really well. Some of them fell like Amazon fell 95% from its peak at the tech bubble around 2000 down to 2002. So not too many people could have held on during that drop and, and, and not sold the stock. So it's important that even if it's a good company and you love the company, you also want to buy it at a good price. So the last one here that we'll talk about is free cash flow. 
So free cash flow is basically the cash flow that comes from operations minus capital expenditures, which is called CapEx in the industry. And what that's looking at, kind of similar to the PE ratio, it's looking at does this company bring in a lot of cash that they can use to either reinvest in the company, uh, to, to be able to, 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 to grow the company, to spend in areas that produce growth. And a high free cash flow ratio, or even when you get into like the price to, to free cash flow or even price to cash flow, it's another valuation metric. And so if the, the lower that ratio is, the cheaper the stock is. The higher the ratio is, the more expensive it gets. It depends on the, on the growth rate, but kind of typically, if you start to get into a price to cash flow above 15, that's starting to get more expensive. If you get in below 15, that's starting to get cheaper. We'd like to buy companies with a lower price to free cash flow or lower price to cash flow as that, while nothing ensures uh, that, you, that your, the stock is not gonna drop, that helps you try to find stocks at a good price. Okay, so last piece here, and probably the most important, even more important than picking individual stocks or, or good funds for your portfolio, is to make sure you have the proper asset allocation, and I'll cover what that is, the proper diversification, and I'll cover that with what that is. So asset allocation, there's different asset classes. So you have stocks, you have bonds, you have commodities, those are different asset classes. Having the right mix of that is important. And so in, in, in knowing yourself, back to the emotional side of things, knowing if you get nervous in the market or, or scared when the markets come down, means you need to add certain pieces of the more conservative side of the portfolio, like fixed income or bonds. So typically that asset class, if you're more scared, you're gonna have more fixed income, more bonds. Um, but if you're a little bit more aggressive, you're typically going to have more stocks. But I think it's important that you do have a little bit of all of these stocks, bonds, and even sometimes like a gold or certain commodities. Because what's most important about the asset allocation is that those asset classes are non-correlated. What does that mean? So if everything is correlated, all the asset classes or all the, the individual investments go up and down at the same time. And we want to avoid that. So I'm, I'm looking here at a chart of 2008, and I just take three simple asset classes, stocks, bonds, and gold. And we look at and see what happened in 2008 as the market went down. That was the financial crisis. The S&P 500, which represents stocks, was down 38%. But if you look here, gold and fixed income was actually positive. So that's, that's a non-correlated asset. You had those two asset classes go up while stocks went down. And that's important because if you only had stocks and you go through 2008 and everything goes down and everything's really cheap and on sale, you don't have really anything to sell to take advantage of these cheap stocks. If you sell a, one stock that's down to buy another stock that's down, inevitably the stock that you sold will probably come back up and you just, you just, you didn't really, it was a wash. You really didn't do anything. But on the other hand, if you have these different non-correlated assets, like, like bonds and gold, when stocks went down, those asset classes actually went up. So you could do what's called a rebalance and sell out of what went up, bonds in this case went up, and, and buy stocks. And you can do that rebalance over time and it allows you to naturally, uh, buy low when things are down, but sell high when those asset classes are up. It also cushions the blow when the market goes down. So it makes it easier to weather that storm. And that's the key piece. And that's why our investment philosophy really strives to manage risk so that you can weather those bad storms. If you can go through a, a bad time like 2008 and not sell, then that's more important than trying to get the most return possible, but then you get scared and you sell when things are down. So I wanted to give you this high level kind of strategy of how we manage risk and, and how we try to teach people to manage risk so that you can make better decisions in your investment portfolio and we can help you better. So if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call or leave a comment down below. Thank you. Take care.